Welcome to Truths That Transform. I'm Pastor Ra Pacienza. My mentor and predecessor, Dr. D. James Kennedy, was passionate about helping Christians to understand the full measure of who Jesus is and what he has accomplished. He is the Savior of our souls, and he is also Lord of all. His impact is like an earthquake, extending out from Jerusalem to transform the entire world. Dr. Kennedy wrote about it in his best-selling book, What If Jesus Had Never Been Born, with co-author Jerry Newcomb. We have produced a special documentary program based on that book, which we're sharing with you today. Modern revisionist historians tell a false story about the impact of Jesus on planet Earth. If you were only to listen to the media, you might think that Christ's legacy on Earth was the Crusades and the Inquisition, and that his followers are intolerant and ignorant. But as you'll discover in this program, Jesus and his followers have positively impacted virtually every sphere of life, including some that may surprise you. God is an ever-receding pocket of scientific ignorance. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Christianity has actually fostered and supported the development of what we now call the sciences throughout the ages. Many people don't realize that a lot of the great pioneers in science were believers in God and believers in the Bible. Ancient science owes a lot, of course, to the Greeks. Modern science owes everything to the Reformation. The development of the scientific method in the 1600s arose out of a distinctly Christian view of the world. And of course, it was a biblical view of reality, history, time, reality, where you have the freedom to explore the world of nature that the Lord has made. You don't have that in either Hinduism and other pagan religions. So there's no question that it comes out of uh, the gospel and the scriptures at large. Science has flourished within a Christian milieu and that's not coincidental. We can trace why that happens. One of the most highly respected historians of science says, we tend to think the, law, the idea of laws of nature you know, is so familiar to us that we think everyone thinks that way. He said, no, nobody, no other culture, east or west, ancient or modern, has ever thought of laws in relation to nature except the Christian culture that grew out of the Middle Ages. All the way up to the early modern period, uh, experimental method where, where Christian thinking was um, really foundational for people like Robert Boyle, Francis Bacon, before that Copernicus, Kepler, and so on. So there isn't a time when the church and Christian thinking wasn't supporting the development of science. Dr. Tom McLeish is a renowned theoretical physicist and also a Christian. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of London, the oldest and still preeminent organization in the world dedicated to the study of science. The Royal Society is the first and earliest of the scientific academies, um, founded in 1663, but it has in its, in its 1663 charter that it's there also to the glory of God the Creator. There was very strong Christian influence in the beginning of the Royal Society. In fact, it wasn't until the rise of Darwinism and the acceptance of Darwinism that people began to think, oh, we can have science without God. The supposed conflict between science and religion has become a tenet of faith for modern secularists. Critics frequently point to the Roman Catholic Church's mistreatment of the astronomer Galileo in the 17th century as evidence that Christianity is anti-science. Galileo verified the sun was the center of the solar system, a view which was at odds with that of the church leadership of the time. Not only is this something the church has apologized for, critics tend to overlook the fact that Galileo himself was a devout Christian and agreed that the Bible set the standard for truth. In a letter, Galileo wrote, Though Holy Scripture cannot err, Nevertheless, some of its interpreters and expositors can sometimes err in various ways. Galileo. 
In other words, what Galileo proved false was not what the Bible says about the universe, but a misinterpretation of what it says, a misinterpretation based on a geocentric or Earth-centered understanding of the universe. In reality, Galileo was yet another scientific genius who believed in the Bible. With the rise and the acceptance of Darwin in the late 1800s, then there came this idea that there was a conflict between science and religion. That's not the way the early scientists thought about science. They felt that they were, in the words of Johannes Kepler, thinking God's thoughts after him. A rational God had made a rational universe and it was their law or their job to catalog the laws of nature that the Creator had actually impressed upon his own creation. The modern world that we know and the modern world that has brought us the, the benefits of health and longevity, the benefits of speedy travel and rapid communication, this world was brought into existence by the scientists of the 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. And it goes without saying that anybody who is willing to invest literally a hundred seconds of time, less than two minutes uh, on some research, will discover that the overwhelming majority of these scientists were Bible-believing Christians. And, um, and, and the greatest names among them Indeed, an extraordinary number of the branches of modern science were discovered or pioneered by devout Christians. If you take a look at the thousand years ending with World War I, the beginning of the 20th century, uh, during that past thousand years, over 97% of all technological, scientific, medical advances and discoveries took place in what I call Christendom. They took place in Christian countries um, overwhelmingly at the hands of Christian scientists, Bible-believing researchers and uh, investigators and early scientists. Uh, that's not an accident. If you are surprised to discover how closely Christianity and the rise of modern science were woven together, it's because you've been lied to by the media, by entertainment, and by our academic institutions that should be teaching history. Ironically, those same entities delight in framing Christianity as backwards and anti-intellectual. Once again, they bank on the very historical ignorance they promote in order to make their case. I am against religion because it teaches us to be satisfied with not understanding the world. Richard Dawkins. Religious skeptics often claim that Christianity is antithetical to education. However, there is a strong link between the Christian faith and education at all levels. For starters, Christianity has brought literacy to hundreds of millions of people throughout the world by codifying many languages for the first time. The link between literacy and Christianity is extraordinarily strong. In fact, all around the world, several languages were initially just spoken languages, but they were never set to writing until Christian missionaries took the time to do that. During the heyday of the Soviet Union, they used something called the Cyrillic alphabet. The Cyrillic alphabet was created by two Christian brothers for the purpose of translating the Bible and Christian liturgy into that as of yet unwritten tongue, St. Cyril and his brother Methodius. Christianity also played a pivotal role in saving Western culture from extinction. For a period after the fall of the Roman Empire, there was a widespread economic, intellectual, and cultural decline. After the Roman Empire collapsed, um, education collapsed, these monks who came from Ireland, the products of the St. Patrick's um, ministry in Ireland, they were established about 100 monasteries in Europe. They were the ones who were teaching literacy. They were cultivating the mind, and this was a unique thing in Europe. 
that a young boy who went to a monastery to seek God and know God, he was actually studying philosophy and logic and language and rhetoric, etc., because he was cultivating the mind. The idea of educating everyone was significantly accelerated by the Protestant Reformation, which stressed the necessity of each person being able to read the Bible. After the Reformation, the first school to which a child went in Germany was called home school, except this was the home of the pastor. He was the educated person in the village, so all the kids will come to his home. That's where they will study, to learn to read and write and sing. During the 17th century, the Bible played an integral role in education throughout the American colonies. The impact of Christianity on education, for example, in the American experience, has been absolutely profound. The early Americans learned their ABCs even in a way that was Christian. For example, in the New England Primer, which they had millions and millions of copies, it was influential from 1690 to about 1900. It was used to teach a lot of the founding fathers. And how did they learn their ABCs? A, in Adam's fall, we sinned all. B, the uh, heaven to find the Bible mind. C, Christ crucified for sinners died. In one way or another, the Bible was the chief textbook during the first 200 years of American education. The Bible was tremendously important in the lives of the people in the colonial period. It's very important in education. The one book that the people would have in their home would be the Bible. And so that's what many people are going to first read. That's, what they're, that's how they're going to learn to read, is from the scriptures. Christianity has also greatly influenced higher education. In fact, around the year 1200, the church created a new phenomenon the world had never seen before, the university. The first universities were founded in the Middle Ages, and they were all founded by Christians. They usually came out of the cathedrals. You know, the cathedrals were trying to educate priests for, to start with. And then, of course, other people started coming in as well, and so they, they became sort of separate schools, and they were the first universities. Paris, Paris in France was a, one of the first universities. The Middle Ages saw the founding of lots of universities. Uh, initially, Oxford and Cambridge, which are our two most famous, they were a collection of colleges. They all had Christian foundations, and in the early days, that is what you went to Oxford and Cambridge to study, theology, to uh, develop your faith, to learn about your faith, to learn about the history of your faith. Um, their purpose has changed a lot, but certainly our great universities uh, were all uh, founded for religious purposes. In fact, virtually every one of the first 123 universities founded in the United States were established by Christians, including many of our most respected schools. It was the Puritans who founded Harvard. It was the Puritans who founded Yale. All the great colleges in America, in fact, every Ivy League school except for Cornell, were founded by Christians for Christian purposes, usually to train ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If Jesus had never been born, there would be no Reverend John Harvard, there would be no Elihu Yale, there would be no Presbyterian elders who founded Princeton, and they created a very literate and biblical society. Although many educational institutions today have abandoned the biblical ethic and turned toward an atheistic worldview, they owe their very existence to the influence of Jesus' life. Most of the Ivy League schools started out as religious institutions. And so a lot of them, of course, have departed from that for many years. But that doesn't change the fact that religion was important to the establishment of many educational institutions, not just here, but throughout Europe and indeed around the world. The motto of Oxford University is, the Lord is my light. If you don't have a one light shining in all the departments, then all of the departments become darkness. And university becomes the source of darkness. It is because of the university today that the West no longer knows what is a girl, what is a boy what is love and what is marriage and what is divorce and what's a family, what is justice, um, because you, there is no light. If Jesus had never been born, there would have been 
no Western civilization, with all that it's meant in terms of human dignity and charity and education and justice and reforms, It's amazing that some people still think of Christianity as being anti-intellectual or anti-education. That's a portrayal that certainly would surprise the Reverend John Harvard, as well as the Christian ministers who founded Yale and Princeton universities. For the first 200 years of this nation's history, education was explicitly Christian, and it produced amazing results. In the early 1800s, John Adams observed that to find an illiterate man in New England was as rare as a comet. Fast forward to our own day, and 54% of Americans between the ages of 16 and 74 read below a sixth grade level, according to the U.S. Department of Education. That's about 130 million people. How interesting that along with the rise of secularism within our own educational institutions, there has been a sharp rise in illiteracy, even as we've poured trillions of dollars into that system. But these falsehoods about our Christian history persist. Jesus has been driven out of the public square because of false beliefs about the origins of America. But I am mistaken in speaking of a Christian republic. The terms are mutually exclusive. Christianity preaches only servitude and dependence. Its spirit is so favorable to tyranny that it always profits such a regime. Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Critics note the irony of this observation. Rousseau's philosophy helped pave the way to the incredibly bloody French Revolution. Furthermore, just 14 years after Rousseau wrote those words, America was founded as an independent nation. America, the freest nation ever created in this world. America was founded by those who sought religious freedom to worship God as they believed he required. This eventually gave rise to every other liberty we enjoy. The followers of Jesus remembered his words. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Matthew 5, verses 13 and 14. As Christians, we're really called to make a difference in our world and in our society. So it would be great for Christians to be involved in every sphere of society, politics, law, medicine, education, because the more we have Christians who are genuinely trying to make the world a better place, they're not doing it in their own strength, but they're doing it empowered by God and his help. Uh, the more society will uh, flourish. And as Christians, we're called to really try to be a blessing to the city or to the place that we are. Uh, we're called to work for the common good. Many of the early settlers and founders of America had explicitly Christian reasons for coming. It was Christians who, for the most part, founded America. They were seeking religious freedom so they could worship Jesus Christ in the purity of their conscience. They then extended that religious liberty and then other civil liberties to others, even non-believers. And today, the non-believers are essentially trying to criminalize Christianity, but it was Christianity that gave birth to America as we know it in the first place. The Bible's been tremendously influential in American government in the colonial period. If you look at the charters or the constitutions of the original colonies, many of them said things like, you cannot hold office unless you believe the Christian religion and the scriptures to be true. Uh, that was just foundational. And that was true after the Constitution was written. When the states uh, write their new constitutions, many of them had in there that you had to be a Christian in order to uh, hold office. A profound moment in American history took place 400 years ago in the cabin of the Mayflower off the shores of Cape Cod in Massachusetts. The Mayflower Compact, 1620, was the first of several, about a hundred or so, biblically oriented covenants, written agreements for self-government under God that paved the way 
for the Declaration of Independence in 1776, which says our rights come from God, and the U.S. Constitution, which was signed in the year of our Lord. One profound way Christianity impacted the founding of America is in the Founders' biblical view of human nature and the implications of that for government. If you search the records of the Constitution of Convention, you'll hear and read and see uh, many references to Jeremiah 17.9, that the heart is desperately wicked, which is why the founders having the opportunity to establish an absolute democracy uh, where 51% decide everything, they intentionally uh, did not form that type of government and instead replaced it with a constitutional republic. The difference there being an objective legal standard based on the laws of God that takes into consideration the depravity of the human heart. And thus the founders separated political power so no one group could lord it over the others. As our founding fathers had a biblical worldview, they understood that natural law comes from God and they put in place a constitution based upon law. Studies have shown that political writings during America's founding quoted the Bible four times more than any human author and the top three men quoted were Christian writers, Montesquieu, Sir William Blackstone, and John Locke. Locke once noted, As men, we have God for our king and are under the law of reason. As Christians, we have Jesus, the Messiah, for our king and are under the law revealed by him in the gospel. John Locke, The Reasonableness of Christianity, 1695. Early on in America's history, uh, while the form of the Great Seal of the United States was being debated and discussed, one of the strongly held views by many of the distinguished founders was that it should depict the Israelites coming out of the land of Egypt and crossing the Red Sea, uh, being led by the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire as the Lord led his people out of Egypt. And with, with these unarguable facts, it is hard to escape the inevitable conclusion that the founding of America was a profoundly religious act. The United States of America was founded on a Judeo-Christian biblical vision. There would be no United States of America as we know it, without Jesus Christ. The essence of America is this. It is one nation under God. It's that we have self-rule under God. Remove God, and then basically you're saying that the state gives us our rights, but that's not true. It is God who gives us our rights, and the founders were humble enough to acknowledge that. Hi, I'm Jennifer Kennedy Cassidy. As you've been seeing on this special program, the impact of Jesus Christ and his church is far greater and more beneficial than the picture painted by modern academics and the media. It was the Christian influence that led to the settling of the country, the writing of constitutions, the division of power, and the governing forms built by our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution. It's absolutely true, and yet, where else are you hearing it? My father, Dr. D. James Kennedy, was a student of history and was deeply upset to see how revisionist history was covering up our Christian roots. That's why he wrote the best-selling book, What If Jesus Had Never Been Born, along with Jerry Newcomb. And we'd like to send you a new ministry edition as our thanks for your gift to help us proclaim the truth and spread the gospel. Christianity has had a decisive impact on the free enterprise system, unleashed the forces of charity, and inspired the modern scientific movement, and that's just the beginning. Find out the true story in What If Jesus Had Never Been Born? And if you're able to give a generous donation of $100 or more, we'll send you the book plus two DVD copies of the new documentary of the same name, What If Jesus Had Never Been Born? You've seen just a part of this eye-opening program today, and we'll send you two copies on DVD as thanks for your donation of $100 or more. Keep one and give the other to a friend, a pastor, or a Sunday school teacher, or a student who's likely only learning the false history peddled by those who want to tear down our civilization. 
This program was filmed on location in Europe and in the U.S. And you'll see scholars and experts unfolding how Jesus Christ and his followers have revolutionized charity, government, arts and music, and so much more. Clear away the lies with my father's book, What If Jesus Had Never Been Born, in a new ministry edition, which will send you as thanks for your generous gift. And the book, plus two DVD copies of our brand new documentary by the same name, a portion of which you've seen on today's program. As we head to the end of the year, your donation is more important than ever. And some generous friends of this ministry have established the $100,000 Hope of the World Matching Challenge. Your gift will be effectively doubled if you give right now up to $100,000. This is a wonderful opportunity to double your Christ-honoring impact as you help us proclaim the hope of the gospel now. We have some of the most powerful, exciting projects in the history of this ministry planned for 2023. So please partner with us in it. Simply write to us at D. James Kennedy Ministries, Box 11154, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33339 or call toll free 877-962-7677 or go online to djkm.org. I feel blessed to have grown up under the teaching of Dr. D. James Kennedy and it's extremely humbling to now stand in his pulpit each Sunday as his successor, continuing the mission and vision that he set out for Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church decades ago. At the time Dr. Kennedy started broadcasting on television, he was like a voice crying out in the wilderness about America's true Christian heritage, about the historical impact of Jesus on every sphere of life, and about the possibility of a new great awakening if Christians boldly share their faith. It's an honor for me to bring you this special program today, which captures so many of the historical truths, too often lost, that he was passionate about proclaiming. If you're in Fort Lauderdale, I'd like to invite you to come visit us at Coral Ridge in person, and you can also live stream us at crpc.org. Thank you for joining us for this special presentation of What If Jesus Had Never Been Born? And here's a preview of next week's program featuring part two. To think of human being as uh, creatures that have a unique dignity, that came from the fact that God had become man. That's next week. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.